Okay, um, we're going to get started with the with this last uh, panel. Um, my name is Fadel Kaboub, and it's my pleasure to moderate this um, uh, conversation with two distinguished uh, economists. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Professor Prabhat Patnik, who's um, uh, an Indian political economist and political commentator who taught for many years at the Center for Economic Studies and Planning in the School of Social Sciences at JNU in New Delhi. Um, he also spent some time as the vice chairman of, um, of the, um, trying to remember, sorry, uh, of the planning, the state planning uh, board um, between 2006 and 2011. And he's the author of, of many books on the process of capital accumulation, um, on the value of money, uh, theory of imperialism, and, and so many other uh, books. And today we want to um, uh, start with uh, Professor Budnick, and then we'll uh, move to Professor Jan Krego. I'll do the introduction right before his presentation, and we'll try to adjourn within an hour and a half um, today. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Budnick. Uh, Professor Kaboom, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'm very grateful to be here. It's only appropriate that on November 7th, which is the anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, we should actually be talking about economic sovereignty in Africa, which means sovereignty against imperialism, and that too at an event which is organized in the name of Rosa Luxemburg. So... <laughs> The experience of many African countries, uh, both experience of decolonization and its sequel, uh, has been quite different, has followed a somewhat different trajectory compared to the experience in the rest of the third world, in, in, in most of the third world. In the latter, decolonization was followed by the institution of a dirigist regime, which Professor Kaboob in the morning talked about in terms of state-led uh, development strategy. Now, this dirigist regime did a number of things. Firstly, it actually uh, <clears throat> introduced a change in the pattern of international division of labor inherited from the colonial times. And it did so through protectionism, through import substituting industrialization, and so on. Secondly, what it did was to try and remove the hegemonic position which metropolitan capital had occupied in these economies, particularly in the resource sectors, in the natural resource sectors, but even otherwise in manufacturing and so on, to the extent that manufactured goods from the metropolis were imported. It tried to overcome the hegemonic position of metropolitan capital in these economies, and it tried to do so often by setting up a public sector with the help of the Soviet Union. Now this, of course, did succeed after bitter struggles in a lot of third world countries actually in removing metropolitan capital from its hegemonic positions, particularly in the resource extracting industries. The third thing which it did was to actually promote, uh, after a very long gap, the development of peasant agriculture, the development of petty production, because of which the food grains growth rate, which actually had stagnated for a very long time under colonialism, even declined in per capita terms, reversed itself. In other words, started rising. Now, these days, much is said in criticism of the dirigist regime. There's a lot of literature which keeps saying how bad it was. But as a matter of fact, if you look at the most elemental index, namely the degree of hunger of the population, then you find that per capita food grain availability, which had declined in most of the colonies in the last 50 years or so of colonialism, for which we have data, uh, reversed 
reversed itself and there was an improvement in the living conditions of the bulk of the people, at least in terms of hunger and therefore in terms of poverty, which is defined in terms of hunger. Now, this regime had its contradictions, but this regime was replaced by a neoliberal regime which arose uh, above all because of the emergence of finance capital as a globalized entity. The roots of that emergence are, of course, multiple, but fundamentally, in the late 50s and the 60s, the US started running a current account deficits, and these were paid for by printing dollars under the Bretton Woods system, where dollar was as good as gold, in fact, $35 to an ounce of gold, and therefore, these dollars flowed into banks, which wanted to go all over the world investing the dollars in terms of giving loans to third world countries and so on. Now, you know, the Bretton Woods system was associated with capital controls. And as a result, the idea was to overcome the hurdles in the way of capital flows, particularly financial flows, that the Bretton Woods system had put up. And therefore, not only was the Bretton Woods system set aside, but you had the emergence of a neoliberal regime, which was under the hegemony of now globalized international finance capital. It's a fascinating story how different countries were brought under this neoliberal regime. Often there was actually loan pushing that, that, that many of these banks, many of these banks who, which were flush with dollars, pushed loans into third world countries in order to trap them in a situation where then the IMF would come and say that you remove the barriers to trade and, and, and you know, free flow of goods and, and capital, including finance. So the hallmark of this regime was to have free flows of goods and finance across borders. And of course, this meant something very important. We live in a world of nation states. And if you have nation states which are confronting capital, which is international, then of course, the rate of international capital must run. Because if any nation state pursues a set of policies which are not liked by international capital, they'll just f f fly away from your country, trapping you in a serious financial crisis. This is something that John Maynard Keynes, if you remember, had anticipated and said in his Yale review article, finance above all must be national. But this is something which was violated, and finance was globalized. And the globalization of finance meant a change in the kind of policies that the state could pursue, a change, if you like, in the nature of the state. Often, the distinction between derisionism and neoliberalism is seen in terms of state intervention versus laissez-faire. Neoliberalism is no, no laissez-faire. It only means a change in the way that the state intervenes, in whose interests it intervenes, and so on. And obviously, in a neoliberal regime, the state intervenes essentially in the interests of international finance capital and of the corporate financial oligarchy domestically that itself is now aligned to international finance capital, which is a big change compared to the earlier period. Now, this also means the withdrawal of state from its supporting role to agriculture, to peasant agriculture, and consequently a slowing down of the growth rate of food grains production, agricultural production, and so on. And in fact, more than just slowing down of the growth rate, it imposes a squeeze on the peasant agriculture sector, which is akin to the process of primitive accumulation of capital that Marx had talked about. So in many ways, actually, you have, with the emergence of the neoliberal regime, a reassertion of imperialism, though of a different different kind. It is not so much US imperialism or French imperialism and so on, but it is really imperialism of international finance capital. And secondly, this is an imperialism with which the domestic bourgeoisie, particularly the domestic big bourgeoisie, the financial corporate oligarchy itself is integrated, is complicit in this imperial project. Now, why do I call it imperialism? It seems to me 
that one of the hallmarks of imperialism, and Rosa Luxemburg wrote about it, though this was not the central point of her argument, is the fact that a whole range of raw materials, but which are the products of the tropical land mass, are raw materials which metropolitan capitalism requires. But of course, since the magnitude of the tropical land mass is more or less given, and much, much of it is in fact used up, it's not very easy to increase supplies of these unless you have technological progress which is land augmenting, you know, which, which, which as it were raises land productivity. Typically, land productivity raising technological progress requires substantial amount of state in investment, state effort, and state activity. In fact, Marx had, had made a very interesting point. Uh, in one of his letters, he had said that in all these oriental countries, you find there are only three departments of the, of the government. One is the department of revenue, which is how to exploit the domestic population. The other is the Department of War, which means how to exploit the foreign population. And the third is the Department of Irrigation, because irrigation is an archetypally land augmenting investment. And of course, this played a very important role in a, a, a number of countries. Now, this is something which, which now, therefore, this since under neoliberalism, state activism for increasing agricultural production, food grain production, and so on is poo-pooed. Generally, therefore, you find that the effort is to prevent any inflationary pressures by restricting the absorption of the already available, already produced supplies. This was true in colonial times, which colonialism achieved through a system of colonial taxation, through a system of creating unemployment, through uh, uh, uprooting the craftsmen, and then so on, uh, through the process of what is called deindustrialization. And this, again, gets uh, reasserted in the period of neoliberalism because of the fact that the kind of investment that the state needs to do to promote the growth in these sectors, particularly in agricultural, particularly food grain sectors, is something which does not occur anymore. And that being the case, it becomes important to meet the growing demands for the tropical commodities which arises through capital accumulation by squeezing the absorption of these commodities within the producing countries themselves. And this is something which, of course, occurs because of income deflationary policies that typically the neoliberal regime is associated with. Now, therefore, we have once more a revival of the same kinds of policies that were pursued in the colonial period, which is why I'm calling it a reassertion of imperialism. The imperialism whose bonds had got somewhat loosened during the Dirigis period once more uh, become, uh, I mean, those bonds again become tight. So you have the removal of the public sector that had been set up to counter the weight of metropolitan capital. You have once more metropolitan capital being re-invited into uh, industries and, and, and particularly into activities like uh, uh, the, the natural resources, you have once more income deflation measures being imposed. And it's not surprising that there is a rise in poverty. As a matter of fact, it's, it's quite interesting that when you look at the world I say this because this is not often appreciated. In fact, there was an interesting article by Paul Krugman who, who said that, look, in the, in the early 1970s, there was, of course, all this inflation, and the world had got into, according to him, a Ricardian crisis, that you actually reached the limits of a whole a lot of raw material production. How did we get out of it? Because through the emergence of new oil fields, through the emergence of, of technological progress in agriculture and so on. As a matter of fact, that's not true. If you look at the per capita cereal production in the world in 19. 
80. I mean, what I did is, is to take three years and then look at the average, divide it by the population of the middle year. For the triennium, with 1980 in the middle, you had per capita cereal production in the world, which was 355 kilograms. That declined, if you look at 2000, do a similar exercise, to 343 kilograms. And then I did a more recent exercise, 2016, and it's roughly the same as in 2000. So obviously there's a decline. And considering the fact that substantial amount of grains are now diverted towards biofuel production, it is obvious that per capita absorption of cereals and by implication of food grains for the world's population is less today than it was in 1980. And consequently, the extent of hunger is greater today than it was in 1980. Which is not surprising, because this is exactly the kind of thing that neoliberal economics has entailed. Now, this, in the case of Africa, the trajectory of development, particularly I'm talking about the Francophone Africa, with which we have been talking, uh, about which we have been talking all day, uh, has been quite different. Because the process of decolonization itself was never completed. Over much of Francophone Africa, you still have French troops which are located there. And what is more, as we saw, because of the CFA franc, there is absence of monetary sovereignty. Now, <clears throat> It is not, obviously, if the French treasury ensures that the, 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 the French franc and, and, and CFA franc exchange rate is guaranteed, then the French treasury would not obviously intervene in the policies that the government is going to ta uh, adopt in, 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 in countries of the CFA franc region, which is not very surprising. But it is not only the fact of the French doing that, which of course is a hangover of, hangover of colonialism, but in fact it is embedded, it is structurally embedded in the situation. If you have a fixed exchange rate visa with the franc, in that case you are without, then the government is absolutely without any instrument for affecting the level of activity in the economy. Fiscal policy is out, monetary policy is out, exchange rate policy, of course, is out, even protectionist policy is out, and as a result, the government is left with no instrument for influencing or raising the level of activity in these economies. Not only the government with no instrument for raising the level of activity, even the composition of activity, particularly breaking away from the colonial pattern of international division of labor, is something which which itself becomes impossible because you, for that you need a certain amount of protection which you simply cannot have. Therefore, the only way that you can come out of it, or you know, I mean, you can hope to come out of it, is if French capital or some other metropolitan capital comes to invest in your country to set up plants for producing for the world market and so on, but not otherwise. And therefore, the government's ability either to influence the level of activity or to influence the composition of activity is something which actually gets undermined. Now, there is a further point. You see, ideally, in a currency, a unified currency area, you must have free labor mobility. Because, uh, which is why the European Union has free labor mobility. Because of the fact that since there is no way that a particular region inside the area can overcome if it is faced with substantial unemployment, can overcome that unemployment, labor mobility provides one way out. I'm not saying that unemployed would actually migrate and so on, but at least in terms of the basic agreement for the unified currency area, you actually have to provide for some labor mobility, which in turn forces you to ensure that substantial unemployment does not develop in a particular region. But that was not the case here. 
As a matter of fact, if that had been the case, there should be free mobility of labor between Francophone Africa, that is the CFA Franc region on the one hand, and the EU on the other hand, with which it actually has a fixed exchange rate. And then we would not be hearing of the refugee crisis into Europe and so on, because at least from this region, nobody could complain if there are refugees going into Europe. So, <coughs> so, so, so that being the case, uh, basically France, or EU had power without responsibility. That that you know that that they had the power to influence policy, but no responsibility. Because if the effect of the policy is to generate unemployment, so be it. Because it's not as if they were facing the consequences of this unemployment, because there was no institutional mobility of labor from these countries to the, the to the to the uh, metropolis. Therefore, when we are talking about this region, when we are talking about the CFA Franc region, that, if you like, is an imperialism within imperialism. There is the imperialism of international finance capital, which is currently kind of, you know, uh, grabbing all third world countries which are open to global financial flows. But what is more within that, there is also the absence of any freedom to decide on whatever policies you can have. Not that you would be getting much chance to have a policy of your choice, but at least even that you cannot have whatever you could because of the French influence. So we have here a case of an imperialism within imperialism. And therefore, it is not enough simply to get rid of the French. It's not enough simply to get rid of uh, you know, the French hold over Francophone Africa or, or over the CFA Franc region and then say we have achieved monetary sovereignty. Because monetary sovereignty then must mean that getting rid of the French influence must be associated with, must, must lead on to an alternative scenario in which you actually put capital controls and generally reduce the influence of globalized finance on your decision making. Obviously, the nation state cannot be autonomous in choosing whatever policies it likes if it is the case that it's subject to uh, open globalized financial flows. Now, this is not just necessary. This is actually something which I believe has come on the historical agenda. And I want to devote a bit of time to it. I believe that the neoliberal regime has reached a dead end because of the fact that the neoliberal regime has two very important characteristics. One is the fact that you have, on the one hand, a flow of, of, of capital now to a number of third world countries, particularly in East and Southeast Asia, where you have metropolitan capital locating plants to meet the global market, you know, China, Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, service sector activities into India and so on. So, so so you have, on the one hand, a situation where there is a sort of outsourcing of activities to a number of regions in the third world. Not everywhere, but at least some regions in the third world. Now that is something which keeps the bargaining strength of workers in the advanced capitalist countries down because of which real wages, according to a calculation made by Joseph Stiglitz, real wages of a male American worker in 2011 were marginally lower than in 1968, so that you find that the real wages don't increase. On the other hand, precisely in the regions to which capital is flowing, because of the fact this is also associated with on the one hand, high rates of labor productivity growth. On the other hand, disposition of the peasantry for reasons that I have been talking about. You actually find that the labor reserves in these countries don't get exhaust, eh, eh, exhausted. On the contrary, they keep increasing despite the outsourcing of activities to these countries. And consequently, their real wages also don't increase. So if you take the world as a whole, then the vector of real wages does not increase. I'm not saying they get equalized, but they certainly do not increase. But on the other hand, the vector of labor productivities is rising everywhere. 
because of which you have an increase in the share of surplus in output, not only within individual countries, but also taking the world as a whole. The fact that people like Piketty find that there is a rise in income inequalities in, the, in, the, in this particular period is precisely for this reason, because you find the share of surplus rises, and of course the surplus earners employ all kinds of hangers-on who generally have higher levels of income, and therefore you find that the income inequalities, even personal income inequalities, increase quite quite substantially during this period. Uh, now we know that a uh, shift from wages to surplus is something which would necessarily give rise to an ex-ante tendency towards overproduction because the propensity to consume out of wages is much, much higher than the propensity to consume out of surplus in any given period. That being the case, you find that this would generally give rise to a tendency towards ex-ante overproduction. Now, of course, ex-ante overproduction did not mean exposed to overproduction because, for instance, Baran and Sweezy had argued in the context of America that because of state uh, uh, expenditure on military purposes, and therefore state military expenditure is something that kept in check the tendency towards overproduction that was generated by increasing surplus in the US, according to them. But of course, one of the things which neoliberal capitalism does is that it cannot allow, or it does not allow the state to play that kind of an offsetting role. Why? For the state to do that, the state must finance its expenditure either through deficit financing, fiscal deficit, or by taxing the capitalists. Because if you tax the workers, then the workers would be spending that money anyway. So basically, then you are taking money which the workers would have spent anyway, and you are spending it. Therefore, there is no net addition to aggregate demand. There would be a net addition to aggregate demand only if you take tax capitalists because they have a much higher saving propensity. Part of the taxes would come out of savings. Now, both these are anathema as far as international finance capital is concerned. Fiscal deficit, as we know, they don't like. And of course, taxing capitalists is something that they cannot possibly be expected to like. Which is why you actually find that the main possible counter to the ex-ante tendency towards overproduction that could be provided does not exist. Now, that being the case, the reason why it has not manifested itself in the recent past is because of the fact that there have been asset price bubbles. In the 1990s, there was the dot-com bubble. When that collapsed, there was the housing bubble. Everybody blamed uh, Alan uh, Greenspan, that look at this man, how, how irresponsible he was. But in fact, Alan Greenspan, simply when one bubble was collapsing, pursued interest rates policies, which actually simply brought on another bubble. But these bubbles, with the, with the collapse of the housing bubble, there has not been anything else of that kind available to the US economy and therefore to the world economy. You, and, and bubbles can't be made to order. You can't hold a gun to somebody's head, some speculator's head, and say, must buy your, the following asset. And that being the case, uh, you find that the world, US economy and the world economy is now caught in a process of protracted economic stagnation. True, there may be some other bubble that may come up, but even if it comes up, its collapse would once more put the US economy and the world economy uh, back where it was. So <coughs> the days of neoliberalism, to my mind, are numbered that it has reached a dead end because the ex-ante tendency to overproduction it generates is something that does not have any counter in the form of state investment. Of course, if you distributed uh, incomes in favor of workers and so on, that'll be different, but that, of course, neoliberal capitalism would not do. So that being the case, you'd actually find that Neoliberal capitalism is now going to be caught in a prolonged period. And the remarkable thing is that this 
tendency towards stagnation, which is now becoming evident, is also affecting countries like India, China, where again the growth rates are slowing down. So the world economy is moving into a problem of this kind. Now, how do we get out of this problem? There are obviously two ways in which one can think in terms of getting out of this problem. One is a suggestion that Keynes had made during the Great Depression, not just Keynes, some German trade unionists had made that suggestion, which is that you actually have a coordinated policy by all the different governments getting together, at least the major governments getting together to stimulate the world economy. Now, imagine what this amounts to saying is that if you have globalized finance, to counter globalized finance, you actually need a global state because any individual state if an individual state, for instance, pursues a fiscal deficit, finance would go out of there. But of course, if you have a coordinated fiscal stimulus, then finance wouldn't go to the moon or anything, and consequently, that could work. And this was a suggestion which Keynes had made in the 1930s for a, a, a coordinated global effort to get out of the Great Depression. Nobody listened at that time, and at the moment, it has not even been talked about. Therefore, the other alternative is for particular countries to delink themselves from the process of globalization by putting capital controls and then stimulating the economy. In fact, this is actually what Trump is doing, except that he's not putting capital controls, he's putting trade controls using beggar my neighbor policies, but on the other hand, he is trying to delink uh, the economy from, from, from the vortex of globalization, though in a way which is extremely unsatisfactory, even from his point of view of you. But I think for the third world, it becomes quite important. And I believe also for the African countries, it becomes quite important. Uh, now, obviously, it is also true that since the biggest capitalist country in the world is grow going protectionist, you see, this export-led growth, I mean, it's a myth to say that, you know, you're more efficient and therefore you can sell more. Export-led growth as a successful strategy worked because of the fact that the leading capitalist country of the time, US, was willing to systematically run current account deficits. In fact, this is something which the leader, if you like, it's, it's part of the leadership role. Britain did the same vis-a-vis -vis other rival capitalist countries in the 19th century, uh, uh, 19th century, early 20th century. But of course, Britain didn't get into any, any, any problems of deficit because Britain actually had uh, what Indian nationalist writers called the drain of surplus from countries like India, where it, 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 it extracted India's surplus in order to ma match its, its deficit. U.S. doesn't have any such, therefore U.S. has got into debt. But the point is that it is an essential hallmark of the leader that it must run a current account deficit to accommodate the ambitions of the other capitalist countries. But this is something the U.S. now is not willing to do. Therefore, even from that point of view, it becomes essential for countries, particularly in the third world, to think in terms of turning to their domestic markets. Now, if they have to turn to their domestic markets, of course, for many African countries who are, which are individually small, the domestic market is not large enough for them to, in a viable sense, actually have home market-led growth. Now, for that reason, it becomes essential for them to come together, at least to form regional blocks. Professor uh, yeah, Patnik, if, if just, you don't mind. Yeah. I'll just finish. Okay. Uh, but of course, this forming regional blocks or regional monetary unions must be different from earlier because it must have, on the one hand, free labor mobility within it. It must have, on the other hand, the block itself must be surrounded by capital controls and trade controls because if you have capital controls, even the U.S. would actually put sanctions against you and you'd have to have trade controls. And finally, you have to have some means of looking looking after the interests of the weaker countries in the region. I once heard Raoul Prebish say that the problem with the Latin American free trade area is that they did not have a policy of investment 
being directed to the backward regions. That is something which would require to be done if such a policy is to be successful. But on the whole, it becomes important now to de-link from globalization. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm going to ask the audience to hold your questions until after Professor Kregel's uh, presentation. Um, Jan Kregel is the research director at the Levy Economics Institute at Bard College in New York. Uh, he's also the director of the graduate program um, at Bard College, uh, the economics graduate program. Uh, Professor Kregel is one of the leading post-Keynesian economists. Um, if you ask me, I would say the leading post-Keynesian economist today. Um, his major works include um, a number of books, um, including um, the rate of profit distribution and growth, uh, the theory of economic growth, the theory of capital, and many other publications. I would encourage everybody to look at his most recent work in the last few years, mostly published at the Levy Economics Institute, many articles on, on Minsky, on Keynes, on economic development. Um, Professor Kregel spent uh, quite a bit of time in the UN system, most notably at the United Nations Conference on, on Training and Development. And he directed the policy analysis and economic development uh, branch of the UN Financing for Development Office. Um, without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Jan Kregel. Thank you, Fadel. It's indeed an honor for me, first of all, to share the podium with Prabhat, who I have known for 50 years, I think. As we were joking before, we are both old enough to have remembered the golden age of capitalism. <laughs> I'm also happy to be here to meet again a number of my former students, Fadel, Mehdi, and I don't know who else I've missed. And I'm very proud and happy, number one, that you have become, what do I say, respected in your profession and also in your home country, which is an important, an important part of the way we do international education. I cannot resist Prabhat's challenge by reminding you all that today is the anniversary of the foundation of the Chinese People's Republic that was announced on this day by... Chairman Mao Zedong, and it's also Trotsky's birthday. <laughs> Obviously, we're going to have a slightly reduced presentation here. So really, uh, I think Fidel already started out by calling this a conversation. So this is going to be a conversation. And in general, what I like to do when I give presentations which are much too long for the time that is available to start out by giving the conclusions at the beginning, which means that everybody can then go home and you don't have to <laughs> stay to listen to the justification. If you're really interested, well, the justification is you can read through the PowerPoint because it's really a, a reader, not a presenter. So we'll start out like this. Um, obviously, we're thinking about MMT, and we're thinking about the role of MMT in developing countries. And someone in the audience heard me remark earlier that I did not think MMT was particularly useful for developing countries. And I'll give you the short answer, or the short justification for that, and that is that monetary sovereignty is something about state money. And it's something that says that governments can run deficits much more easily than we thought they did. The BBC likes to talk about MMT as the magical money tree. Well, this is not how you build development. You can have state money and you cannot develop. You can have government deficits and you cannot develop. You need much more than that. And in particular, you need not only state money, but you need a domestic financial system in order 
to promote development. So that the part of MMT is, that is lacking is the problem of putting together what that domestic financial system should look like in order to support a process of development. So that's the bottom line of what what I am trying to suggest. Now, if we have time, hopefully I'll be able to tell you exactly how I think you can do that, but we'll start out by setting up what I think is the problem. This is a very long and complicated thing for saying, and you read the first line, employment is the basic problem of developing and industrialized economies. This is the thing that we have to solve, okay? It's true for developing economies, but it is also true for developed economies. Why? Well, I won't go through the long story, which I like to tell, starting out with V.A. Carvey Rao's use of John Robinson's idea of disguised unemployment, to point out that when you have technical progress and when you have economies that tend to be concentrated in particular sectors, you have a problem of finding employment. And the question is, how do you find employment for the entire population? Now, standard development theory tells us that we have to find some place else to find that employment. And where is it? Virtually every theory of development says you find that in some other sector that has, number one, a higher productivity per man than agriculture does, so that you can absorb agricultural employment, increase real incomes and real wages with the higher productivity in manufacturing. The problem with this, and this is why I say it's a problem that every country faces, is that manufacturing sectors also s are subject to technical progress. And this creates excess labor in manufacturing. So you simply repeat the problem. And if you look at the hollowing out of the Japanese economy, if you look at the US economy today, you look at other economies, manufacturing is in a process of de-employing large proportions of those people who used to find the support in those sectors. So it's a continuing problem. And the continuing problem, which is generated by basically the impact of technical progress, which does what? Which increases productivity, increases the it creates the possibility of increasing real incomes, which then creates the demand which allows you to industrialize, which is fine. But at the same time, as it creates the purchasing power that allows for the expansion of manufacturing employment, it also creates higher output per man, which reduces the demand for employment. So we never escape from the problem. So the basic point which I'm trying to make is that what we're looking for is financing industrialization or financing that thing. Now, as I say here, it's a bit misplaced concreteness. It's not manufacturers per se that we're looking for. It's basically some form of higher productivity employment in order to engage in this chase for continuing to find employment as we go on. You can see what I'm telling you is a very similar story to the story that Marx was telling. I'm just telling it in a slightly different way. That is, the system has to always be running faster in order to catch up with itself, and it never does. It's always reproducing the industrial army, and that industrial army is the thing that we have to find employment for, and that's what is employment going to do. Now, one way of doing this, as we know, and I'm surprised that it's not come up more in uh, these discussions, is employer of last resort. Okay, one of the things that MM, positive things that MMT does do for us is to say that if you want to solve the employment problem, that the ability of the government to run a deficit without recourse does allow the possibility for government to step in and to solve this problem through employer of last resort functions. But this is not a solution to the problem. That is, we are not going to create economic development simply on the basis of uh, employer of last resort, uh, employer of last resort programs. So having said that, we've got the question of domestic finance for development. Okay. Where are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? And here I'm going to cut out from the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the formal presentation. There are a lot of quotations so that I can appear to be knowledge in the literature and step back and 
as I say, give a warning, okay? A warning is what? When we're looking at financial systems, we have a tendency to believe that what currently exists has always existed. And this is, as I say, the neurobiologists tell me that this is normal. That is that our brains can only function if we actually believe that everything that has happened before will continue to happen. Otherwise, we could not be sentient beings and we could not survive. Now, when you're doing economic policy and you're making proposals, this is very dangerous because it constrains your ability to look creatively in order to solve your problem. So that we have an existing financial system and if we look at that existing financial system, we can say, how can I fix the existing financial system in order that it could meet the objectives of creating additional employment? And partially, this is what the discussion about MMT is and the discussion about monetary systems, okay? We come from a profession that has a brain that is programmed to believe in the quantity theory of money. It's very interesting. If you look, I did this uh, some time ago for another presentation. You can do Google searches. And I was looking at a Google search to look for MMT. And you see MMT runs along like this. And then Alessandra Ocasio pipes up about financing the rest of the world with MMT. And you have a little spike. And then it goes down like this. And I said to myself, well, I wonder how this compares. So I then looked for monetarism. <sighs> Off the chart, okay? You can't even see MMT anymore. The scale goes up. Then you do quantity theory. Exactly the same thing, okay? So what I'm saying is that we tend to be sort of obsessed with looking at, number one, our existing financial system within a theory which is bound by the presumption that the quantity theory and monetarism are in some sense the major theory that we're looking at. Okay? So in this sense, you can look at the entire evolution of endogenous money. We'll get to this in a minute. When Nicky Calder got up and did his stuff on endogenous money, what was he doing? He was looking at Milton Friedman. And he was saying, Milton, you don't understand. This is the way the system really works. But he was looking at the system as it then existed. Okay? He wasn't looking at all possible monetary systems. He wasn't look at, looking at all possible ways of doing this. Okay? Now, what I'm going to do is very quickly go back to what is my favorite hobby horse. And that favorite hobby horse is a formulation of the evolution of monetary systems, which you can find, well, you can find it as far back as Stuart, and you can find it in the middle of the 1800s in a number of US economists. You also find it in a number of German economists in the beginning of the 20th century, in terms of looking at monetary systems simply as clearing systems. Okay, now I'll save you the rest of the citations. We'll just do a quick example. Okay, we're all part of a group, right? We all have to trade with each other. Okay, so if I'm a quantity theory economist, what do I do? I say, okay, we have this problem that you have to trade, and you have to trade, and you have to trade, and there's all these bilateral trades, and it takes a whole lot of time, and it's very inefficient, so that the end result is that the market is going to produce a single commodity of all the commodities that we trade, and all exchanges and all prices are going to be done relative to that single commodity. Okay. And then we proceed by saying, what could that single commodity be? And we look and we say, well, it has to have certain attributes. And if we look at all of those attributes, we end up by saying, well, the best thing to satisfy those attributes happens to be gold. Okay? So gold is money, if you're a quantity theorist. You have to have a single thing, okay? and this is important, that single thing is going to be what gives you all of these cross rates, 
and it facilitates exchange. Now, if I'm not a quantity theorist, how might I go about this same procedure? Well, I might think of it in this way. I might say, I'm a producer, and I want to produce my product, and I want to compete with other producers. I have to produce a price for that product. How am I going to express that price? Okay, I sell boots. Well, maybe we could set up a system in which I denominate all of my prices in a notional unit of account. Okay? Now, I didn't invent this. William Petty invented it. Okay? The essay on diamonds, in which he says it's extremely difficult to compare diamonds. If you're going to have exchange in diamonds, you have to have a single unit of account specifying the grade of diamonds, and that's the way the market compares them. Okay? So you can start out by saying, instead of the problem of bilateral exchange, my problem is creating a unit in which I can compare and which the market can function. Okay? That unit of account can be purely notional. We can invent it. Okay? And all of these systems start out by presuming that in order for capitalist systems to function, they require these notional units of account. Now, that unit of account we can look at in the following way. As I said, we're all part of a system. Okay? What now if we all exchange amongst each other? But when we make those exchanges, you register with me as the bookkeeper those exchanges. So I keep a book. Okay? You have a balance sheet. You have debits and credits. And because I keep a balance sheet, we now have this second necessity this came from the fact of trying to calculate profits originally. That's where the accountants came up with this idea. But if every one of our exchanges is recorded in my books in terms of debits and credits, number one, we can run a perfectly good economic system without having any physical thing that is money. All we have are units of account. Now, why would be willing to do this? Well, you're willing to do this because you have debits and credits all across each other and they're all on my books. So if you want to make a payment, you simply come to me and I have to pay Fred 25 dinars. So I said, look, you've got a credit here of 75. I debit your credit account and I credit the account of Fred and we're done. Okay? So you're absolutely willing to participate in this system. Why? Because everybody is in debt to everybody else, or everybody has credits with everybody else. Okay? And that unit does not require any money at all. Okay? So, first point, well, now we know where endogenous money comes from, because this is a purely endogenous system, and it's an endogenous credit creation system. Is there any limit to the amount of economic activity that we can create this way? No. Okay. As long as everybody is willing to take debits and credits, there's no limit to the amount of credit and the amount of econo economic activity that we can finance in this way. Okay. Are there difficulties? Sure. What if I'm a crook? I'm keeping the books. Okay. You're my friend. I write up your credit account. And suddenly you've got a credit in which there is no debit in the rest of the system. The system now doesn't close, and we have the possibility of crisis. So the system depends on the bookkeeper being honest. Second, what if you make a request okay, to finance production, and that production doesn't turn out, okay, so that you don't generate enough credits in the other rest of the system. Also a possibility. This means what? This means that me as the bookkeeper and you as the debits and credits should be doing due diligence. Due diligence in the sense that you should not be willing to give or accept a credit or a debit in a system for which you think it is not possible to be repaid. Okay? So, and I say, we have a perfectly good financial system. We can run this system without money. It's a purely domestic system. Okay? And basically, this is a network. 
as long as we're all part of the network, okay, the system functions perfectly. Where do we get into difficulty? Well, the first place that we get into difficulty is going, well, you, I was about to make a joke about the US health system. Okay, in the US health system, if you go to a doctor that's out of network, you actually have to pay money. Okay, your insurance doesn't cover you. The same thing, if you want to make a transaction outside of the network, what happens? You're in trouble. You can't do it. Okay? If there is another network in the hall next door and you want to make a transaction, you can't do a credit debit matching transaction with that other system. You need, and that's where you need something, okay, in order to execute a payment. And that eventually, this is what Keynes in the treatise called money proper. Okay, money proper is something that you cannot create in terms of a debit-credit relationship, but it's something which can be used to eliminate a debt. Now, you can think of Keynes Clearing Union as doing what? Keynes Clearing Union was simply saying, we took that domestic system that I just described and we created a meta-system, okay? A clearing system across different networks. And this is what Keynes was trying to do. He said, we just have debits and credits. By Just in case anybody is confused on this, Bancor was not a currency. It was a notional unit of account. It could not be held. It could not be seen. It could only be used in order to eliminate a debt across national payments networks. Okay? Now, this is why you have a difficulty in terms of, uh, say, what we call monetary sovereignty. Okay? What does it mean for our little network to have monetary sovereignty? Okay? I don't need the state to declare what is money. What do I need the state to do? The state determines what the unit of account is, because this whole system only functions if we all agree what is the unit of account, and we all agree to use this bookkeeping procedure. Okay? So monetary sovereignty here is the state determines what is the unit of account which we are going to use, and then it determines the payment system. It supports the payment system, which is effectively still a private system. And it's interesting that if you look at Keynes' work, he always, and this is also true of Schumpeter and other theorists, it was always the case that they said that these private clearing systems preceded state money. It was only that the governments figured out how to do this later. Minsky, by the way, also does this. Okay? So the first thing, your sovereignty, okay, is always limited. It's always limited because if you've got to go to another payment system, if you've set up your own payment system, okay, you only have sovereignty within that system. So the alternative is, if you want real sovereignty, you don't deal with the guys next door. This was what we talked about in terms of capital controls. Capital controls mean what? means you do not trade debits and credits with other networks. The other alternative is to say, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to trade with these other systems and, well, how are we going to do that? Because we've only got units of account. Nobody, nobody can do this, so what do we do? Well, we say maybe the private sector could set up a system of buying and selling debits and credits across payment systems, which is in fact what we ended up with in the Bretton Woods system. That is, we would have rates of conversion between payment system A and payment system B. Now, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that anybody who engages in doing that, okay, is taking a credit from one network and a debit from another network, okay? And how do they make sure that those credits and debits are going to match? It's still going to require either something physical that goes back and forth, okay, or that intermediary is itself going to have to create its own debits and credits. Okay? Now, in fact, this is what banks always do. This is what our current banking system does. Okay? We have a system of internal 
debits and credit payments. What does a banker do? A banker simply matches debits and credits across individuals, and when they don't match, says, okay, I will issue my own debit to you, okay, and my own debit will serve. Now, what does that mean? Well, that's exactly the same thing as me being the crooked bookkeeper, okay, except that the banks get away with being crooked bookkeepers as long as, what happens? As long as not everybody decides to cash in their debits or their credits at the same time. And the people who wrote in this academic tradition understood this perfectly. Colwell, an American economist writing in the mid-1800s, he talked about this as a fraud and an incredible blunder of allowing bankers to intervene in these credit systems by creating their own, their own means of payment. So the point which I'm trying to make is that there is a system that is a purely domestic system. That purely domestic system has certain constraints, and those constraints have to do with exchanges with other payment systems. If you note, the, well, the, end, of the, the end of the title had to do with the external constraint. Okay, what is the external constraint? The external constraint is that you cannot use your domestic credits in order to trade with networks outside the system. And that's basically a development strategy, which say that requires on external, uh, that requires uh, external imports. Now, having gone through all of that, you see what you missed here? This is, okay. Now, the last piece of the story is, okay, we've got digital stuff. How many digits have I got left, Sveto? Five digits. Okay. New payments technology. Okay, if you think of this clearing system that I just gave you, okay, new payment systems are a godsend for this. Okay, we could do it perfectly. You just pick up your phone and we just go back and forth with our phones. I mean, we're perfectly willing to do that. If you're a quantity theorist or if you're a crypto, Okay, crypto always reminds me of these zombie things that, you know, if you're a crypto, then you're sort of zombie. If I'm a crypto guy, how do I think about this? What is, what is crypto, really? Well, if we start out, remember the quantity theory business with gold? Incidentally, gold was hardly ever used to make payments. This is one of these big myths. The same thing is true of the gold standard. Gold was hardly ever used in order to make international payments. But as I said, we all believe this. Now, if we think of that, you think of commodity money and you think of the Bank of England. Bank of England did what? It said, oh, I have a way of getting around actually using gold. It's called a banknote. Financial innovation. Isn't this cool? And I can also make a lot of money because I can produce a lot more banknotes than the gold that I've got. And the presumption always was that the banknotes simply substituted the gold that the Bank of England had. Spoiler, Bank of England never had any. That was the whole deal. They signed the charter with the king without any gold. They promised to give the, give the king gold. When the king asked for the gold for the army, they said, well, sorry, we can give you some of these sealed notes. They're just as good as gold, and now you can fight the war with France on the basis of the sealed notes. Okay? What happened next? Well, the bank had a monopoly. So the country banks came up with what? The idea of a checkable deposit, a demand deposit, okay? So the demand deposits now simply substitute for the notes that substitute for gold, okay? But you notice all of these things are still, you know, the gold is still here in the back of my head. All of these things are representatives of gold, okay? So we keep going. And eventually, what do we get? Well, if I'm me, I look at a banknote. And I see that a banknote has written on it digits. And I'm going, oh, I've heard of this before. Digital currency. Banknotes have digits on them. Why can't we just substitute for the notes the digits? And we just trade the digits back and forth. Okay? 
Now, we already do this in securities markets. We have QSIPs, we have international security identification numbers, all sorts of markets simply trade back and forth. You don't buy and sell share certificates, you just send the numbers back and forth. Okay? Why, why can't we do this with, with this? Why do I need this anymore? Why do I need a bank at any I can, okay? Now, somehow or other, this Nakamoto guy managed to convince us that there was something like a great invention of taking the digits off of the banknotes and saying, we're just going to trade the digits back and forth. Okay? So, is there any difference between Bitcoin or any one of these things, whether you're running it with distributed ledgers or whatever, between these things and other things that stand for gold? And this is the basic problem with Bitcoin, is that they all are quantity theory monies. And they all are subject to the same kind of criticisms of quantity theory monies. If they're going to work, these things have to be what? They have to create a relationship between, you're a producer, you need inputs, you're a producer, you're selling inputs over here. Bitcoin doesn't do that. Bitcoin simply transfers credits back and forth. Okay, where do the credits come from? Well, there have got to be debits someplace in the system. You don't have a monetary system unless you've got credits and debits, which is why we're never going to have Bitcoin doing anything that allows us to fund the kind of development strategies that we would like based on domestic, okay, based on domestic financial systems. Now, I will now finish, Fidel, and this thing keeps dying. This is okay. Uh, yeah, here we go. Advantage of clearing systems. Here we this. Last two things. If you want to know more about comparison between digital systems and other systems, this is a paper which came out of a massive European Union project in which they spent a whole lot of money in which we simply told them stuff that they should have known already, dealing with the way you can use clearing houses and digital systems in order to finance development. And this is an alternative which, uh, which was produced for ONCTAD in terms of the using the clearing principle as a basis for regional financial arrangements in developing countries. So that the argument here is that if your domestic financial system is insufficient in order to generate a large enough interaction between debtors and creditors, if you put a number of developing economies together, then in fact you can create inter, well, interregional debits and credits which may allow all of the systems to maximize the amount of domestic financing that they can do. It's a very interesting, Keynes himself was the one who suggested this possibility of having regional uh, clearing systems. Unfortunately, it's one that's more or less dropped out of, uh, out of discussion and dropped out of the literature. And what this study does is to attempt to suggest a possibility for applying them. The unfortunate thing is that as a result of, well, the Washington consensus and the opening up of economies, the important point between, or the important point for the creation of these regional systems is the degree of interregional trade across regions. And if, I, I can't remember the data which I used here, starting in about the 1960s onwards, you find that despite the efforts of developing countries to try to create special preferences amongst themselves, the amount of intra-developing country trade for the major regional uh, associations has in fact declined and declined dramatically. Trade with the developed countries has increased dramatically and hopefully this would be one way of reversing that, uh, that trend. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have uh, time for questions, so please, um, I don't know if there's a mic in the back, uh, Maha? Yes. 
And in, in, in the meanwhile, as we're getting the questions, I'll just remind our visitors here, since we're talking about November 7th date, that this is also a meaningful date for uh, Tunisia. It's, it's the date that where we transition from the end of the Bourguiba regime to the beginning of Ben Ali regime. So it's, uh, it's also meaningful in different dimensions. Yeah. It's a date. It's important. Uh, ma question, c'est pour uh, notre premier panéliste. Uh, il a parlé de <coughs> la politique agricole des pays uh, en Afrique. Uh, je lui pose la question. Moi, je représente un organisme professionnel agricole. Quelle politique agricole doit instaurer un pays d'Afrique s'il veut éviter l'impérialisme <coughs> en tenant compte de la conjoncture économique actuelle, internationale. Sorry, I, I didn't quite follow. What should agricultural policy be given the current uh, cyclical movement in the global economies? For African economies. No, you, you, you know, as far as agriculture is co concerned, it's not only a question of cyclical movements. Of course, you need, you need state intervention to stabilize the agricultural market. By the way, this is something which was done in the 50s and 60s in many countries. You detached your agricultural prices from the world prices. While world prices fluctuated, you actually maintain stability of your domestic agricultural price by announcing a, 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 a price that the state would, at which the state would buy, for instance, products. So you can always stabilize agricultural prices by detaching them from the international prices. That is one thing. But the other is that the price at which you wish to stabilize domestically must be profitable as far as the peasants are concerned. And for that, obviously, if you have a profitable price, then you cannot have a high consumer price because that is something which is going to affect the consumers, particularly the poor people. Therefore, you have to have a food subsidy. And if you have a food subsidy, then of course that subsidy has to come out of the budget. And that's where the IMF and finance capital comes in. They actually say, no, no, you cannot have the food subsidy. And so one of the reasons why in many of these countries you actually have food stocks lying around, but, but people are going hungry is because they just don't have the purchasing power and you cannot sell that food at prices affordable to them without having a food subsidy that then makes you exceed the fiscal deficit target. There's questions in the back. Merci. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, for uh, Mr. Patnek. Uh, if uh, the Indian government uh, asks you for advice uh, about joining uh, the regional uh, comprehensive uh, economic um, uh, partnerships, uh, what would be uh, your advice, yes or no, and why? And uh, my second question is uh, for uh, Mr. Kriegel. Uh, you, you kept uh, talking about trade, and uh, when we talk about uh, neoliberalism, neoliber we, all, uh, we all always talk about uh, the uh, IMF and the World Bank. Uh, my question is the, about uh, the role of the World Trade uh, Organization in this, in perpetuating uh, the system that penalizes uh, developing countries. Thanks. Go ahead. Okay. Basically, what I mentioned at the end is that the introduction of the so-called rules-based uh, international trade system is one which has prevented the 
imp well, the implementation of agreements that were originally reached at the 1964 UNCTAD conference where Raoul Prebisch proposed the idea of uh, a general system of preferences across developing countries where developed countries should give preferences to developing countries and the creation of expanded uh, trade amongst developing countries which was again enunciated at UNCTAD 11 by President Lula of Brazil to, and I stood virtually, what, four feet away from him when he made this declaration that Brazil would always give preferences to trade with developing countries irrespective of the relative prices of those, of those trades. Now, obviously, all of this goes against WTO regulations. So the, w to the WTO, in fact, impedes developing countries from working together in order to expand trade amongst themselves. And this is also a point which Prabhat brought up at the end with Prebish's comment about the difficulties of unions, uh, regional integration in Latin America. Prebish always said that the thing which caused the failure of those unions was the great deal of differentiation in productivity across different regions. And it would have required, as Prabhat mentioned, it would have required targeted investments in order to increase productivity levels of the, uh, of the more depressed regions within the Latin American continent. Uh, you know, my answer would be, don't join. And I'm very glad that they have not joined. Because this is something which would have hurt the peasantry and it might also have hurt agricultural, uh, uh, the, 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 the industrial sector. Uh, let me just make one point clear, as far as I'm concerned. The so, you know, that an economy, let's say you are in position A, and you wish to go to position B. If position B has cheaper commodities but unemployment, then I would not call position B more efficient than A. The concept of efficiency must mean efficient, full employment of resources. Therefore, generation of unemployment is something which is, I find unacceptable. And that being the case, I would have advised the government of India not to do it, and I'm glad that they have not done it. So, oh. Go ahead if you have the mic already. Okay, um, so I have a comment for Prabhat. And um, so, so in the talk, you highlighted the sort of inequalities upon inequalities that you get from having an integrated monetary union and then um, uh, no freedom of movement. And um, I would just like to say I prefer us to talk more about, uh, in terms of justice, what we want on the left, I think we should talk about equality of movement rather than freedom of movement. And that's because freedom of movement is so tied in with the movement of labor rather than people. And, you know, Samir Amin drew this distinction. And also France and Europe do have freedom of movement, not only um, for them around the world, but they also have free mobility of labor. They can get undocumented labor uh, to their heart's desire and also uh, skilled labor. And um, the reason I like to talk of equality of movement is because I think of Senegal, for example, introducing visa charges and the national sovereign projects might um, try to level the field a little bit rather than talk about a kind of borderless world which imperialism creates at the same time as creating uh, boundaries. Uh, no, I, I, I believe that inequalities, okay, let's say freedom of labor movement is formally a way of overcoming inequalities. But I say formally because we know all kinds of problems are associated with it, which is visible in the EU. You know, I mean, it's not the case that so Germans are not willing to accept, let's say, others coming in. The British are not willing to accept uh, the East Europeans and so on. That's an unfortunate fact. And that being the case, obviously, freedom of labor movement is not really the panacea for inequalities. Uh, but, but that's where what Prabish was saying becomes relevant, namely that it is very important, therefore, to actually preempt any necessity for labor movements 
by having investment planning, by actually directing investment to those regions where the per capita incomes are low or where there is greater unemployment and so on. If that is done, then there will be no need for any labor movement. But labor movement is, labor movement is formally a way of, you know, I mean, it need not arise. In fact, our whole idea should be to prevent it from arising. But on the other hand, it's a way of, 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 of ensuring that the problem is not ignored. Thank you. Um, thank you for the, both presentations. Um, Prof. Kregel, I'd just like to know, um, uh, you know, the U.S. dollar has been prognosticated to uh, fall and collapse uh, many a time. What's your reading of the situation right now in terms of, uh, you know, the rise of China and the trade war and the pressure that Trump is putting on China? Are we looking at something more like the Plaza Accords or something? Uh, what's your speculation on that? Uh, and then just the second one is, uh, for both of you, is, uh, look, reason and empirics have failed us. You, I mean, we can't go to our central banks and say, listen, here's the data and this is not going to work, even when in Greece, you know, they predicted the GDP is going to collapse and all that. What are the strategies that we use when reason fails? The dollar will rise and fall. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering if... Uh, no, I mean, if you look at the argument that I've made, is that all, all the systems that we currently have always depend on a single unit of account. In the advanced systems, the single unit of account requires, as Keynes told us, a money proper, okay? We do our contracts in unit of account. I can't make a payment in unit of account. How do I actually make a payment outside of the system? The dollar is the money proper, which allows us to make those payments. So as long as you have a system in which the unit of account is the US dollar, the dollar will be the center of that system. Now, whether it rises or falls, this is a question which is determined by international speculative investment. And this is something which depends on domestic monetary policies. It depends on domestic economic performance. And it depends, well, on all sorts of things of which I have absolutely no competence to comment. The same thing in terms of the, the trade negotiations, okay? If I were a psychiatrist, I might be able to make some sort of statement about what I think the objectives of the U.S. government are. I have a pretty good idea of what the Chinese government thinks it's doing. And that is simply that China has been there a long time. And the Middle Kingdom lasted for a long time. And we are now going through a resurrection of the Middle Kingdom so that there is absolutely no necessity to do anything in the short term but to wait until next November. If in the meantime you manage to get concessions, and again, this is difficult to predict, but if we go into the election, in which the current president has not been able to complete his, uh, his barrier, and he has not been able to complete any of his other basic campaign promises, one possibility is to make a very quick deal with China. Because as we know, the uh, tariffs are having a very sharp negative impact on those states in the Midwest which he counts on for his electoral advantage. And these are both in terms of agricultural production and in terms of manufacturing. So eventually he may decide that in order to support his election, re-election chances, it's best now to just close this deal and be done with it. And that's a, a good possibility. If I were advising the Chinese government, I would simply tell him to wait until he's a private citizen, and then we'll deal with that. Which about one? reason? Hmm? Central bank? Can I go ahead? Okay. Reason. Oh, well, central bank is not a reason. Look, um, 
It's extremely interesting that in the last, what, two or three years, the Bank of England, uh, the Bundesbank, and who else, I don't know, another bank have published papers indicating that they now understand that when banks make loans, they make loans by creating deposits, okay? Now, if you were at the Bank of England 30 years ago, there was a member of the Bank of England staff who wrote a paper saying precisely this. It's Tim Congdon. It was called The New View of Money, if I remember. It was published in the Lloyds Bank Review. I was a student there. I read the Lloyds Bank Review. I looked at this and I said, yeah, so what? Because you could find the same thing written in chapter one of volume one of Keynes' treatise on money. You could find the same thing written in Dennis Robertson's little book on money. You could also find the same thing written in a 1906 book written by Hartley Withers. And this is just for the English literature. You find the same thing in Albert Hahn, in Schumpeter, in Ben Dixon, in any of a wide range of German economists. You sort of scratch your head and you say, where have these people been for the last century? And that's why I started out by saying we have to be careful of the quantity theory indoctrination that we have built in to the way we look at things. Central bankers actually believed this. They believed that banks did only intermediation, that I took them a deposit and then they said to me, I am very good at finding good investments for your deposit, so that's what I'm going to do and I'm going to charge you for that function. This is the famous diamond dribbing model of banking. So they believed it. What can I do? I mean, we would have had to abolish Harvard and MIT and all of the major institutions that teach this nonsense. Robert Schiller, the Nobel Prize winner, if you look on the Yale website, you can listen to his lectures on banking. What do banks do? They take savings from individuals and they invest them. Okay? These are young Yale graduate students who are going to work in the finance industry. All right? So what can I do with the central bankers? I mean, this, as I say, this has been taught in every sensible university and every sensible curricula since the, at least the turn of the century, well, the turn of the last century, since the 1900s. I mean, every, Hartley Withers was a financial journalist. He wasn't even an academic. Okay? If you look, I mean, I challenge any of you to look at Robertson, look at Keynes, look at any of this stuff. You can see it written clear as day. I mean, it's not a, a, it's not a secret or anything else. This is something that it was taken as standard theory. Okay? Phillips, book on bank credit. Okay? Why, why was this something which was important? It was important because bankers themselves always insisted that, oh, we don't create money. We're simply intermediaries. It's not our fault if all of this happens. Bankers actually believed that they could not create money, and they argued against, and that's why most of these economists took the pains to explain to them that if a bank made a loan and the person who took that loan transferred his deposit to another bank, that didn't mean that the credit disappeared. It remained in the system. But every individual banker said, no, I can't create credit because if I did, somebody would take and spend it in a different bank. Okay? Now, bankers, just as bad as the central bankers. And that's why the central bankers believe it, because the bankers believe it. You know, it's not only the bankers. I believe, I really believe that capitalism itself is an irrational system. After all, <laughs> I mean, you know, after all, this morning we were talking, you know, why should they oppose to a fiscal deficit? Invariably. I mean, if you're close to inflation and so on, that's different. Why should they always oppose a fiscal deficit? It's, 
I mean, it's, it's irrational in the sense that something which appears ra rational to us does not appear rational to them, because having an activist state, then they get worried. You know, Kaleski wrote a very interesting article, you, you must know about it, political aspects of full employment. That, that, you know, why is it that capitalist economies could have full employment, but they don't have it? Okay, we'll take the last two questions. So the person with the microphone, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I was wondering if uh, Professor Prabhat could um, you know, respond to the rather novel idea that pro uh, Professor Craig has suggested where there's a non-quantity theory of money. And I would imagine it's sort of decoupling uh, the realization of surplus value from the war, you know, existence of money. So I wonder if Professor uh, Prabhat could react to that. Uh, because, I mean, in Marxist theory, money actually comes because, you know, capitalists need to realize their surplus value. But, I mean, if we then leave that theory, how does you know, the system then work when you say we have a system of merely like facilitating exchange between you know, agents in a capitali capitalist system? No, Marx was completely opposed to the quantity theory of money. Absolutely opposed. In fact, he criticized Ricardo because Ricardo in the short term, in, in other words, Ricardo believed in Say's law. You know, if you, if you say, that the value of money is determined in the long run through the prices of production, but in the short run by the market price of, of, of money, then that amounts to saying that suppose in the short run you increase the supply of money, then its price must fall, which means other prices must rise. That's quantity theory. So Ricardo was a short-term quantity theorist, and Marx was scathing in his criticism of it. Marx completely rejected the, the quantity theory of money. No, so, so, so the, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know what various people have interpreted him to be, but he is absolutely opposed to. In fact, I, I argue, in fact, in a book which I wrote some time ago called The Value of Money, that 75 years before Keynes, Marx had come to the same conclusions. He has a notion of a hold. A hold is the same as Keynes's liquidity preference. That if you have a greater desire to hold, then there's a crisis in capitalism, okay? So the only thing is that Marx did not have a theory of the multiplier about where, if there's a crisis, where does the economy settle? That he didn't have. That, that Keynes and Kahn introduced in 1930, 31. But otherwise. otherwise. Yeah. May I? Um, regarding uh, Dr. Kregel's uh, remarks about endogenous money and the views since, um, you said Robertson and Keynes. I guess even before, in, in the beginning of the 19th century, Henry Thornton wrote about paper credit in England. So, Bank of England. So did I. I can't for me. Yeah, just a, co a comment. But my question was uh, regarding your explanation about like a credit theory of money, about all the settlements and all that. Could we define monetary sovereignty as as a, the ability to avoid final settlement by the governments. It's like a, a question for both of you and Dr. Kabu. So to avoid final settlement, like the United States can, as like the um, exorbitant privilege. And so does all other states like Japan and in a minor scale. So my question is that, thank you. We will collect the four questions, the four remaining questions. Well, I want to thank the two presenters uh, for making uh, a recall uh, f of uh, uh, principle of financial systems. Uh, I will try to speak in English. If I have some trouble, I will call for the help for the translator. Uh, the problem or the main question of the, the deep crisis of underdeveloped nations is their linkage to the globalization of financial system. And you, you, you speak uh, about uh, the how to delink nations from uh, international financial system. 
And uh, you recall, uh, it's very important to, to explain that theoretically, it is possible for uh, underdeveloped nations to develop their own financial system. But speaking about uh, international economics is ultimately a geopolitics, uh, because uh, autonomous of underdeveloped countries is not granted uh, at least if we think uh, it is possible uh, sur le terrain um, uh, of politics we, we will think uh, about North Korea about sovereignty so the, prolifer or the proliferation of uh, nuclear weapons and uh, uh, I, I don't see another way to get uh, independence and sovereignty about fin uh, national financial system. Or the other solution, theoretically, I think it is uh, what Dr. Patnik speak about, is uh, when he speaks about outsourcing, and equalization of wages about nations, which creates instability in uh, metropolitan, uh, metropolitan uh, nations. And uh, for they, if they are rational, they will uh, think themselves to delink their economy from uh, international economics by means of protectionism. Uh, so, I, I think uh, these are the two solutions uh, to delink uh, underdeveloped countries from international financial system and recover some sovereignty about the, their uh, economic policy, uh, fiscal and monetary policy. Thank you. So, uh, my question is concerning is a uh, uh, concerning the the uh, hypothesis or the theory of the end of neoliberalism, uh, don't you think that uh, with the uh, rise of the uh, mega corporations around the world, the end with the the model of uh, of China, that the evolution is more. Uh, that of a fusing between uh, the neoliberal states or the neoliberal economics, uh, neoliberal economics with uh, communism, with uh, uh, communism in its aspects of statism and of the presence of the state in all the, the aspects of, uh, of the economy. The other question is uh, regarding the... Uh, uh, there is a, a historian, uh, Asher Ibot, that, uh, who studied uh, uh, medieval uh, uh, finance and medieval uh, financial institutions that uh, viewed hist the history of finance as a history of the centralization of uh, clearing systems. He made this conclusion mainly based on the creation of the the Taula of Barcelona, which was uh, the first trace of a central bank in history. And uh, when you follow the, the history of finance, you find that again and again and again, that uh, each time there is an evolution in financial institutions, there is uh, uh, somehow a centralization that adapts to that uh, evolution. But with this, Centralization, centralization, as you said, uh, comes uh, power over the information that are being treated in the by the centralization uh, by the centralizator of uh, of these clearing systems. This this power is uh, can be seen as the reason for uh, fractional reserve banking and the power of bank of bankers uh, nowadays and at the same time of hegemonic uh, currencies and all the system that comes with them. So those are my uh, two questions.
this is a, but that's a very interesting idea that I did. money is avoiding final settlement. I think it's a, a nice way to look at it on the international basis. Just as a, uh, a backup to that, I just last week was in St. Petersburg with a bunch of Russian economists who are interested in MMT. And one of them commented to me after I had told this similar story. He said to me, well, you know, we used to have in the Kamehameha this system of transferable rubles. And now you're telling us that that was probably a pretty good system. <laughs> and my response to him was, yeah, it was probably good for Moscow, but it was not good for the rest of Comic-Con. Because... But it was not good for the rest of Comic Con because, because basically, Russia didn't have to engage in final settlement. They were the ones that was they were running the clearinghouse basically. No, this is not correct. Well, no, ex explain this because this is this is this was the comment that came back to me. Okay, I can only well, I can only remember. Perhaps they were these kids were too young to remember how the transferable ruble system <laughs> worked. But any, anyway, that doesn't take a, take away from the idea that yes, certainly what the U.S. does does have is that it's not so much uh, the ability to avoid final settlement, but to always make final settlement simply by deciding to create more means of final settlement. Um, can I add something to this? Yeah. A question to you, because yeah. in times of financial, cri the last financial crisis, the you know the club of super central banks, the Fed included, the Bank of Japan, the ECB, they set up these uh, emergency swap lines for international settlements. So is that a quick and dirty, temporary way of doing this for the privileged club? That you know the Keynes plan would expand that as a systematic well, no i mean basically what this did was to say that the us was the only one that did manage to avoid final settlement all the rest of them were indebted to the us and the only way that they could meet their commitments was by borrowing dollars from uh, borrowing dollars from the fed and as i say this is this is the you know if you like to look at this as the exorbitant privilege as never having to mm -hmm. produce because Inherently, it's your own currency. You can always produce it. So that is, um, at least internationally, is a very sensible way of looking at, uh, I think, for the moment. Um, in terms of the, the problem of globalization in developing countries, I mean, here we're back to the WTO. Uh, the WTO not only requires for most countries, and in particular for those countries who sign the financial <coughs> protocols, to open up your domestic financial markets to foreign financial service institutions. And if you have foreign financial service institutions, then it is impossible for you to, in fact, engage in domestic uh, monetary sovereignty for your financial system. So that was you know, part of the presentation that I skipped over. But one of the difficulties is to set up your own financial system, they have to be domestic in financial service institutions. They, can, they cannot be international. Um, and the, well, I don't know, I didn't quite understand the rest of it, whether it was necessary to have nuclear weapons to have monetary sovereignty. But that's possible, I mean. <laughs> I, I, I just want to add something, you know. Okay, delinking does not necessarily mean that you become an authoritarian state. In fact, it's a completely, you know, I mean, I'm old enough to have lived in the pre-neoliberal <laughs> days. And, and, and India was actually far more democratic during the period that we had our own national financial system than it now is. So, so the idea that delinking must necessarily mean that you get into some kind of an authoritarian North Korean kind of state is something which I, I believe a lot of the European left, I think, believes that, which is unfortunate because it is not at all necessary. Okay. In fact, delinking must mean democratic control on the state and on economic policy. Uh, on this question of end of neoliberalism and fusion of neoliberalism and communism, you know, to what extent this Belt and Road Initiative, how much money is being spent on it and so on, nobody quite knows. There are all kinds of different views about how much is being spent on it. But the basic idea 
is that in a socialist society, if you want to generate demand, then the way to do it is by raising the living standards of your peasants, of your workers, and so on. So I don't see why the Chinese should be going around basically looking for export markets through RCEP and all kinds of things instead of improving the living conditions of their own people. And that would be the obvious socialist thing to do. So. Yeah, I just to follow up on that, I mean, it's, it's interesting the change that has taken place because when I used to uh, attend the I, uh, IMF interim committee meetings, the Joe, the Chinese central banker, when he was pushed in order to appreciate the currency, his response was always, why should I do that when we really should be increasing domestic wages? So this was, or that is, all until they entered into this new, this new policy of the of the Belt and Road. That was always the response. He said, "If why would we, why should, why would we be so stupid, to <laughs> to do that when the alternative would simply be to allow domestic wages uh, to increase?" Before we finish, I'd want to make a comment on the last uh, uh, the last comments on the history of uh, of central clearings. I didn't quite get the reference, but I would very love to see it because I. You know, I I very much uh, in agreement with that sort of uh, that sort of tradition. I mean, if you if you go back to pre well, if you go back to the eleventh, twelfth century, you can all you can already see very that very clearly uh, at work in what we call medieval uh, financial systems. And I'm not aware of that particular reference, and I'd very much like to see it. Thank you. With that, I'd like to. Uh, thank our keynote speakers for this uh, wonderful conversation. And I'd like to invite everybody to join us tomorrow morning to continue this conversation caffeinated and refreshed. So see you tomorrow morning.